everyone and welcome. Welcome to the, uh, the webinar. We'll be starting in about four minutes at top of, uh, of the hour. So, uh, welcome to everyone that's, uh, that's connecting. As always, why don't you use the, uh, the chance now just to put your location where you're connecting from in the, the webinar chat, uh, just so that we got a, an idea as to where people are calling from uh, today. So uh, yeah, let us know where you're joining us uh, from and we'll be starting literally in about four minutes time. So welcome to everyone that's connected. Welcome to uh, The Missing Link, preparing our people for the future of AI. And we'll be starting that literally in about four minutes time. Arizona, Sydney, Australia. Now that is keen. Yeah, oh, wow. excellent. All right, excellent. Robert Taylor, shout out. Yes. I work uh, that out. That's coming up to midnight. We're starting at midnight. So that's very, uh, very impressive. I hope the conversation is going to be so exciting, <laughs> stimulating that there's no way you'll be able to go to sleep, even if it is gone midnight. So uh, welcome and uh, great to have you uh, with us. So just let everyone else connect through over the next few minutes and as always good to uh, to see everyone connecting jacksonville boise and it's when you see these names you think it must be a lot nicer here where than, than where i am at the moment <laughs> so, uh, i think actually anywhere would be nicer than a wet uk at the moment because it's pretty cold Pretty damp and wet and horrible, so not much going for it at the moment. But never mind. I think that's a little, that's par for the course, isn't it, Graham? Oh, it shouldn't be. <laughs> In fact, on the news earlier today, it was saying I think some parts of Scotland they've had twice the expected rainfall for April, and it's only the tenth. So wow. just some crazy weather patterns going on. A lot of flooding in Russia today too really is i think it was a hundred thousand homes flood or ten thousand okay i may have got the zero wrong even so ten thousand hundred thousand that's a lot of flooding so um we're not going to do a a true weather forecast we could do a global one but that's not the purpose we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence but specifically preparing our people just going to wait a couple more minutes as everyone connects Please use the webinar chat to say where you're connecting today so that we uh, so we know where everyone is coming from. From our previous events, previous webinars, we know literally all over the world and uh, and that's people connecting live. We know a lot of people want the recording because unlike others in uh, in Sydney, it is gone midnight and they want to listen to the recording rather than join us live. But uh, great to have anyone join live that uh, that is with us today just give it a couple or more minutes it's always the case people connect right at the top of the hour right at the, yeah right at the start probably because they don't want to hear me waffling on before but there is nothing worse than joining a webinar and just hearing silence and our budget doesn't run to some nice introductory music you've got us chatting before start to uh to warm everyone up and uh just sort of get into the uh, the throes of the uh, the conversation. But looking forward to the next 60 minutes. And I'm sure we've got some great things to, uh, to, to share. So lots of people connecting now. I think we have a winner in the location stakes. Our former panelist, Clay, is uh, call, calling in from the French Riviera. Oh, Clay. Oh, yeah. We're <laughs> great to have you with us. Even if it is very, uh, yeah, we're very envious of the uh, the location there. Mind you, Madrid would be nice as well, but I think the French Riviera has the uh, the edge. I will be in Nice in a couple of weeks' time at a, a procure, uh, procurement event, um, Nice in France. So looking forward to uh, to some decent weather there. Must be better than, uh, than we've got elsewhere. Numbers are still calling, but it is exactly top of the hour, so... We'll give it literally 10 seconds and then yeah. I think Omar over to you so that everyone that's connected on good time gets the uh, the most of um, the conversation that we can do today. Should we uh, should we get started? 
I think we should. Yeah, let's go for it. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, and interestingly enough, welcome to the first webinar of 2024. Um, I was actually thinking this is our second webinar, but the last one we did was back in uh, in December. But welcome. Uh, thanks for making the time, uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, to, to dial in and be part of this uh, discussion. Um, the topic today is really around one that is, I mean, it's, it's on every news feed, it's on everyone's strategic agenda, it's on... Um, you know, it's on every C-level execs wish lists and beyond, and that's artificial intelligence. But we wanted to tackle this topic from a bit of a different angle. You know, there's a lot of conversation around artificial, artificial intelligence and, you know, um, a lot of the ins and outs and the value and the benefit and all of those sorts of things. But we wanted to tackle it from a little bit of a different angle um, than the coverage it typically gets. And, and that is specifically, how do we prepare our people for a future that's driven by AI? And, you know, amidst all this excitement around how AI is going to transform procurement and um, uh, and how it's going to deliver value to, procure, uh, to organizations in general, I think that's one key ingredient that really doesn't get enough attention, right? How do we bring our people along? How do we prepare them for this, this uh, radically different future, um, what, whatever that future specifically is going to look like? And, you know, what are we doing to position them for success? And, and I think the practical reality is, is that we're not. It's not happening today. In fact, there's a Gartner survey uh, that recently said about 14% of procurement departments, only 14%, believe they have the adequate talent they need to meet the function's future. And that's really a big deal. So, so what do we do? Well, that's really what we're going to dive into today. And to tackle this conversation, and in a, in, a, in a little bit, I'll go through kind of the structure of the conversation. But to tackle that conversation today, we've assembled as always, an esteemed panel of experts. Um, I'll let everyone do their own intros in a second, but just to introduce the panelists themselves, we have Rudin Namud, who is head of procurement technology strategy, sorry, procurement strategy transformation and operations at GE Healthcare. Welcome, Ruji. We have Ryan Teeples, who is head of global sourcing at Keysight Technologies. Welcome, Ryan. And as always, we have the inimitable Graham Crosshaw, who is <laughs> procurement content director and board member at CASME. So uh, panelists, I, uh, if you could do your own introductions, uh, Ruji, we'll start with you. Thank you very much, Omar, and um, thank you for having me on this panel. So um, I'm Ruji Mahmood, and um, my area of responsibility at uh, GE Healthcare is, at the moment, this topic is very prevalent. So really looking at what are the tool sets we're operating with today, the processes and the human uh, resources that we have with it. Um, so we spun off from the GE business last year. And so as a result, we, we have the opportunity to look at our systems and data and human architecture and really say, do we have what we need to be fit for future? So it's, um, it's really good to be here and um, I'm really excited to get into the conversation. Well, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Ryan? Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Teeples. I, as mentioned, I do oversee procurement, uh, specifically indir indirect procurement at Keysight Technologies. Uh, we are a test and measurement company, electronic test and measurement solutions company. Um, we're based in Santa Rosa, California, but I sit in Colorado Springs. I've been with the company for 19 years. I spent the first 13 years as a uh, finance person. So I like to say I'm a recovering finance person, I'm, and, and I am now the um, you know, learning procurement. And so I've, I've spent the last about six or seven years really working to transform our organization. So this topic is, you know, perfect for us uh, at this at this time because it's all about transformation. So happy to be here. Fantastic. And great to have you here as well. And we're looking forward to, to hearing your insights on the questions today. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, a man who needs no introduction, but for the four or five people who don't know him, Graham. <laughs> yeah, so Graham Crawshaw, Procurement Content Director at CASME, the uh, the community that supports uh, procurement with different events and roundtables and enables me to sort of represent that, uh, that community because we've also been doing some recent benchmarking on AI, so I'll be able to contribute and bring that to the conversation. All right. Thanks, Graham. And I'm uh, Omar Abdullah, co-founder of the Smart Cube. Uh, we provide procurement intelligence and analytics solutions across category commodities and risk for procurement organizations all over the world. So uh, with the introductions done, um, let's dive into our conversation. So as I said, our, our discussion today is going to focus around 
how do we prepare our people for a future of AI? And there's three parts um, that we're going to tackle this conversation. It's sort of three sets of questions we'll go through over the next hour or so. Um, what are the expectations of procurement in a post AI world? Number two, what does the profile of tomorrow's procurement practitioner look like? And number three, how can we begin to bring our people along towards this future state? And then we'll wrap up with actually a fourth question around two takeaways, but that's the broad structure of the event. Uh, and we'll dive into these um, uh, one by one, and then we'll go through this and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to questions at the end um, uh, as we go through the conversation. But before we kick off with the first question, um, I believe we have a poll, Graham. We certainly do. We like doing polls, and, and we've got four of them that we're going to pack into the uh, the one hour that we've got for you uh, today. First question, has your organization invested in AI tools to support procurement activities? And just select one, make it nice and easy to begin with. First of all, we have no plans to invest in AI. Number two, we're building the business case. Number three, we have the business case and we'll implement this year, 2024. We have the business case and we'll implement next year, 2025. Yes, we've invested and we've implemented. So I think it should be quite obvious. Let's get some real good data from this particular group. We've got over 220 people on the call at the moment. So it will give us a real good feel what is going on in uh, procurement give you a few more seconds please uh, respond to this poll and just to say we are going to share the recording of this webinar so you'll be able to uh, hear it again if you've missed any of the points i think that's given us in the interest of time let's that's given people plenty of time to uh, to <laughs> respond so 41 percent of you saying that we're building the business case interesting 17% saying no plans to in invest. 13% are going to implement having done the business case this year. 6% um, uh, next year. And 23% saying you've already invested and implemented. So almost a quarter already on that journey and others yeah. really looking forward as to when they're going to uh, start. So I don't know. I think that probably is what we would expect, given that we're now in, in April. Yeah, I'm quite intrigued by the some of the extremes that a quarter uh, feel like they're there with the investing and implementing. And then about 17 percent have no plans to invest. That's that's quite interesting. Um, Ryan, Ruji, thoughts uh, uh, from either of you on the on the poll results? I think. For yeah. Me, I look. No, you, go, you go ahead. Sorry. I'll, 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 I'll prompt somebody. Ryan, what, what right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think for me, that that is really interesting. I think when I look, when I think about what AI actually is, I think the definition is so broad across AI that um, I wonder what it looks like mm -hmm. with those that say they've, they've fully invested. What does that look like on their side? And then for those that say they're not, um, you know, I really go back to AI and think that it's a variation, at least partially a variation of what we talked about several years ago with digitization. Mm -hmm. And so when we say we have not invested in AI, uh, the very beginnings of AI is really becoming more automated and, and more, digitiz or more digitization within our processes. So I, I wonder, I just wonder what the thought is on, on each of those sides. You know, what does a full Im implementation look like and what does somebody that has nothing look like? Yeah. Ruji? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think um, uh, from my experience, I've seen so many companies where we do have procurement platforms, whether they're a complete source to pay um, platform or, or, you know, a smaller sort of specific uh, sub process area. Most companies have technology, uh, procurement technology. And, and so there is some form of AI, there, low code type of AI. So I wonder if um, we need to clarify definition a little bit yeah. more. Um, and also what would be interesting is really to understand the 23% who have invested, not just which areas, but how much are they then investing, not just in tools, but also the, the change management and the human part, which we're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah well, the change management we'll definitely get into. It. It's interesting. Uh, and that's a good point, because I, I wonder, you know, when a lot of new technologies come along, they're new, but then when they are part of our workflow, we don't even think of them as technologies anymore, right? Like, right. 
Microsoft Word is what it is. PowerPoint just is what it is. It's not really tech, so to speak. Um, but I wonder if that's part of that definition. That's a, that's a good point. But I think that gives us a, a, a jumping off point given kind of where folks landed. But let's, let's dive into that first question. So what are the expectations of procurement in a post AI world? And Ruji, I'll, I'll start with you. How do you think the role, procurement's role and expectations of it from internal customers and other stakeholders how do you expect that to change in the coming years? Um, I think quite significantly and um, really very much in the direction that we as procurement professionals have been pushing. So we've wanted to do more strategic work. Um, we've wanted to um, demonstrate to the wider organization that procurement is not just um, primarily a transactional um, after the, the deal's been done, come in and put the contract and, you know, cost focus. Um, we want to be uh, getting into driving innovation. And actually, that's what I think a, a post AI world will enable us, uh, because it will take away a lot of that repetitive transactional activities, so that we can get closer to the business and also the business is um, integrating more uh, AI solutions within its operations um, and, and I think that it's it's the perfect time for us to be able to show that um, uh, there is more that procurement can bring to the table um, and for example we could uh, become more strategic partners um, who leverage AI powered insights and data analysis for example which will help the, the business to drive smarter decision making and, and you know much more aligned with broader business objectives um, so so yeah I, I think it's uh, definitely a, a space that uh, we've been pushing for a long time and this is only going to enable us yeah Ryan does that align with your your perspective you agree it does I think you should ask her to go first every time she just covers it so well <laughs> um, I, I really think just a couple of other thoughts is I think we're going to be asked to be faster and more efficient. And so the turnaround times will need to be quicker than they have been in the past. People are, are ready to have data right at their fingertips and AI definitely helps with that. Uh, the other thing that I'm seeing within our organization is I believe we'll be asked to do more with less resources. And so, you know, as we go through, um, you know, a bit of a downturn that, that the world's in right now, um, we have less resources within our organization as the world upticks, which it will. Um, and I think it will go very quickly when it happens. Um, we're not going to be able to hire a bunch of additional people. And so we're utilizing this time right now to become more efficient. And so when the uptick does happen, we'll be able to have more throughput through the organization. And so, so one of the points that I want to sort of um, maybe a, a two pronged question to follow up on that is, you know, what do we expect is going to be different and, and what are some of the things that won't change? So, so Ryan, you touched on a couple of things, right? So turnaround times, cycle times are going to uh, compress. People are going to expect much more. Um, uh, you know, there's the, and this has been happening for a while, but I think it's only going to accelerate being able to do more with less. Um, if you think about particular tasks or activities or sub-functions, however you want to sort of think about this and, 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 uh, Rudy, uh, actually, either of you, whoever wants to go first, can talk to, to this. But what are there specific things that you think will be different, or some things that just won't change? You don't think that's going to uh, change, regardless of what happens with Gen AI and where the function goes as a result of it. Uh, so I guess I'll go first on that one. Um, so things that I think will be different, and, and it's happening right now. I think we have to be able to upskill or reskill our team members. Um, I really think that in the future, our jobs will be done by people that use utilize AI tools. I, um, when you talk about AI, I think there's always this mis misconception that a robot's going to come in and sit at your desk or something like that in the future. Um, I really don't see that happening, but I do think that people that do our jobs will utilize AI. I think the world is changing very quickly, and that if we do not um, start embracing AI tools, somebody else will, and they will become more efficient. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're going to have more information at our fingertips. And so this idea of us being generalists will, will close. We'll, we'll be able to um, close that knowledge gap. You know, we might not know everything, but we can type it in and the AI gives us a lot of information that really does help us to become uh, a better consultant or a business partner to those people uh, internally or externally that we work with. So I think those are really the things that, that will be different. Yeah. Ruji, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, just to sort of build on what, what Ryan's saying, I think the, the 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 concept of doing more with less, we should put that forefront and, and really step back and think, um, what will enable us to do more with less? At the moment, what the business is, and it doesn't matter which industry you're in, everybody is wanting to drive productivity, increase efficiency, and, um, and, and also deliver better uh, cost transformation. So as procurement function, we need to think about our roles and think about which parts of those can we utilize um, AI and technologies and, and as a, you know, augment ourselves. So as, as Ryan says, not be afraid that it's going to take over our roles, but let go of those transactional repetitive activities um, or even you know, data analysis that can allow us to move much faster um, and give the business uh, information so that they can move faster. Um, and uh, I, I think we need to look really at the procurement process end to end and see where are the, the opportunities where we can plug procure, um, AI solutions into. Some areas, um, for example, sourcing, contracting, spend management, we've had technology solutions for a long, long time there um, and they're getting smarter. Um, the, the amount of tools that are available are also increasing. The data these tools have been working with have been, uh, are also much more um, sophisticated. So there's a lot more capabilities. But when you compare that to human capability, we've just not evolved as fast as technology or those solutions have. So I think um, we need to be a little bit concerned <laughs> if we're not utilizing the tools well enough that others and other companies will move faster. Um, and so think about really, uh, you know, where, what are those areas where we can integrate uh, AI capabilities to allow us to deliver better results to the organization? Yeah, you, there's a there's a great quote um, I've heard uh, repeated uh, around th this broad topic, which is, you're not going to lose you're your job to AI. You're going to lose your job to somebody who knows how to use AI. Yeah. And I, and I think that applies pretty nicely. Graham, from a PASME uh, perspective, I know, you, I know you folks have done a lot of research and in looking into this and canvassing the, the CASME community and, and what they yes. think. What are, you, what are you hearing? Yeah, I mean, of our 240 members that we've been sort of really getting the information from, um, first of all, the rate of change, I think, is a is a key point. And uh, we've just done our first poll and it was like looking at sort of the response from the our members was like 35 percent have said, yeah, they've already invested. And the area of investment, 85 percent have said it's in task automation. 78 percent have said it's all about insights to help decision making and 40 percent saying it's about compliance. So it really is trying to equip you so that you can do your job better. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's really tuning in what would really help you do your uh, job better. I do come back to the point when you said what won't change. I think it's relationships. We mm -hmm. almost want the tools so that we can focus time on building relationships. That's really what we're about in procurement. Everything else is just sort of trying to make it happen. And if you can use the tools to do that better, then you've got time freed up to do the uh, the more interesting and activities that your stakeholders are going to appreciate more. Yeah. I, 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 sorry, Ryan, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%. We, we didn't really uh, talk on those things that won't, won't change, but I did note that relationships are will be key. Um, mm -hmm. I agree 100% with what Graham said. The other thing that I think won't change is um, I, th I think the negotiation process will change, but I think the human touch in negotiation will always have to be there. You have to make a decision on, you know, what's more important. You can have a, a piece of, of software kick out, you know, here's the benefits, here's the drawbacks. But at the end of the day, you'll still have to have a decision made. And I, I believe the human touch will be required there. Yeah, I, I sort of think of it as... Um... You know, if you look at it on the spectrum of sort of fundamental, sort of basic uh, uh, activity, and then there's or standard activity, if you will, and then more complex activity. I think a lot of those standard activities, you know, whether it's transactional purchasing, standard negotiations, you know, some of the fundamental analytics capabilities, that's going to get automated. That's going to get picked up and managed and driven by the technology itself. It's the human insight, thinking, curation. 
uh, uh, application to the context and situation that we're grappling with. I think those pieces unlikely to change. But let's actually dive into, because that, that begins to touch on what the practitioner of the future looks like, which is question number two. But before we go to question number two, I believe we have a, a second poll. Graham? Our second poll, yep, yeah, I've just launched uh, that. So it's not always straightforward. Um, what's the biggest obstacle for effectively preparing procurement professionals for this AI-driven future? Please select one. And we've got a number of options here, starting with lack of budgets, resistance to change. We've already spoken about change management, lack of support from the executive team, inadequate understanding of AI's potential impact, confusion around the choice of AI technologies. And oh, we could spend an hour just talking about that. Uh, concern over data security, GDPR, for example, or other. And if you want to use other, then please use the chat to say what that other is. We're limited as to what Zoom will let us do. But if there's anything that's fundamentally sort of being that obstacle, then, then share that uh, with everyone under the uh, other and then put it in, in chat. So just give you a few more seconds to, uh, to respond to uh, some of those, uh, those ideas. And I think we're almost there. Yeah, we've got uh, almost, uh, we've had just under 250 people. So that means the data is really interesting and, uh, and very sort of timely. And of course, because we don't have any supplier trying to sell AI solution, you're, you're hearing this from procurement, supporting procurement, which gives it credibility. I must admit, I hear from many suppliers, it gives you the impression everyone has already done this AI implementation, but that's a, a personal view on, on that. Let me shut up, share the results, and you can then see. Um, really interesting here. So we've got this inadequate understanding of AI's potential impact on procurement. We're still learning, I think, and that's 43 uh, percent, which you could only have one, yet 43 percent have, have said that. And then it drops right down to confusion around the technologies, something I was hinting at, and then lack of uh, of budget. So those are the obstacles. Any surprises there? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's a short answer. It, it's a... You know, what, what's interesting to me uh, is the inadequate understanding of AI's potential impact on procurement. I wonder how much of that is fed by some of the confusion in the marketplace. There's so many mm -hmm. solutions out there. There's yeah. so many tools um, and there's so much hype around that that I think we can't see um, we, we can't see what, what the true value is, if you will. I mean... Ruji Ryan, do you agree? I, I'm not going to make the mistake, Ruji. Why, why don't you uh, comment, and then Ryan, you can comment. Yeah, yeah, no, no, completely agree. I think you know, you you just go out to the market, and there's just so many solutions. And where do you start? And and there's so much hype about the more advanced solutions, and and so almost kind of a pressure of, um, is is that where we should be starting? Um, and and actually, um, you know, a few of those areas about where do you start? I think start with your problem statement. And that's certainly that what we've done. We, we've sort of, you know, shut off everything else and said, what are we trying to solve? Um, and try and, and what is, where is our organization in terms of our uh, technology and, and how things will fit in with it in terms of our process maturity and also our, our, um, our people and, and their capabilities with adopting technology. And, and we've gone for um, solutions that help us with that problem statement and will grow at the pace of our organization and our requirements, but also give us the opportunity to make those leaps when we are ready and we've got our foundations in place. And I think just one more point is the role of the procurement person, and I know we'll talk about it later, but it's just evolving so much. I mean, it's broader and it's deeper and there's just so much more on our mandate. And to take that to the executive team and say, you know, we, we aren't just all about buying products. There is a lot more areas that we are touching and a lot more business impact that we can have. And these solutions can help us with it. Um, and for example, recently, what we 
we've done is utilize the, the data analytics tools that we have um, to help with um, bid defense, for example. Um, so there is a lot we can do, and it's about that thinking out of the box and um, really staying close to the stakeholders problem as well. Well, hold that thought on thinking out of the box and close to stakeholders, because we're going to come to that. Ryan, uh, your your thoughts on the on the poll and, and some of the comments there? Again, I think it goes back to what we talked about initially. It's really just the definition of what is AI. And so, you know, how do you implement something when we don't even know what it, what it is? I was uh, typing the other day in, in Teams, sending a chat, and Teams finished my thought for me. <laughs> and that that's actually AI. And I think it's starting to happen. You know, I type a text on my phone and it starts giving me the next words that I'm going to say. It is AI. And I don't know that we really necessarily think about that, but it, but it's here. It's already here mm -hmm. and involved in the things that we're doing. As I go out and, and talk to vendors about AI, a lot of vendors will tell me all the wonderful things that, that their AI can do. But we've all been sold things by vendors that, you know, I, I, they're still in the learning process, you know, yeah. can, can AI really go out and read a contract and bounce it off against what our T's and C's are internally? Well, not quite yet, but it's getting there. So it's very interesting. I mean, that's that was my thought is that, you know, it's still this definition of what is AI, where is it going to be? And it goes all the way from finishing a text to machine learning where it's doing, you know, all of this other stuff for us. And so that, yeah. that was what came to mind. So uh, so I, I just want to make one comment and then let's jump to the, the, the second question. Um, the one thing in that poll that I actually was uh, uh, heartened by, if that's the right term, was the lack of executive support was not really an issue. It was only in like 7%, I think, was the, the number of grams uh, in terms of what came out. But that was, that was great to see. And I think it's probably also understandable, just given the pressure that's on organizations to perform better, to use that term broadly, and, and hence uh, executives looking at that and saying, well, clearly AI is a, a critical, important technology that's gonna help us to get there. But with that, we've talked about the, you know, the, the roles, expectations uh, in terms of um, how, uh, what procurement might look like and, and what the broad brush strokes uh, of the role would look like. But what does that profile of the practitioner actually look like? Right? What what skills uh, matter the most? And um, uh, you know, are there particular? You know, we've touched on some of this. So Ryan, I'm going to ask you to to kick this off. Right? I know you mentioned uh, uh, strategic thinking aspects like that, but other. How do you sort of think about that role of the future practitioner? Yeah, so I I wrote down a whole bunch of things. I'm just going to give a couple, but I think really some of the keys are. Uh, change management. I mean, change management internally is uh, very important. You're going to have to have those soft skills to be able to do that. Um, and the other thing, I think we, we need people that can logically think about and interpret what's coming out of AI. Um, you know, I can have AI write an email and I'm like, that is not what I want to say whatsoever. And so how do we go back and logically interpret that? Um, people have to be willing to change. And so I think, you know, being able to get out of our comfort zone and do things that are different. Uh, just a brief story, uh, about three months ago, we started um, implementing a, a version of ChatGPT internally. So it's behind our firewall and we're looking at it. And I went into my staff meeting and I said, uh, this is what I'd like us to start doing. About half of the staff had no desire to touch it. Uh, they had all of the questions and concerns and how do we do with that? And the other half of the staff was very interesting or very interested and started that process. Um, within about three weeks after I'd done a demo and done a few one-on-ones with the people that were not interested, it changed immediately. And so again, I saw that within my team, people were willing to change and uh, the rate at which people have adopted this, you know, once they start utilizing the tools, I think is it's yeah. crazy. I've never seen anything so fast happen within an organization. Um, I then took that same presentation and went to my um, my manager's staff meeting and shared it. It was the exact same thing. About half were very interested, half did not want anything to do with it. So again, it's just that idea of what skills will matter the most. Well, the ability to be flexible and change. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's that's really interesting. And I think that that exposure, that willingness, and, and it maybe some of that willingness even if it's not there at the outset, what I'm hearing from you is, let's expose them to the potential and the value that the technology can bring. And, and that opens people up as well. Uh, Absolutely. And it helps that that a lot of these AI tools are super simple and easy to use and in our own natural language as well. Ruji, your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, 
so so technology at the end of the day um ai or, or not ai it's 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 a tool and it's going to deliver an output which you know we program it to do so i think the one thing that we need to be really clear about as procurement professionals is really to master the end-to-end -end process we and understand our business if we understand procurement and how procurement works and we understand the business requirements then we can select our tools and we can set them up to deliver the output it's it's a little bit like your ac structure right so it, the tool comes on the doing it's not accountable it's not you yeah. know it, we, we will program it to be responsible to deliver whatever it's going to the output will be so if if it is the the contracts part for example we need to be clear that within the contracts what we're defining is in line with our business's expectations um, and the standards and the KPIs, the SLAs, everything. The, the tool can provide us with options. We have to decide on those options. And the only way we can make the best decisions if we have mastered end-to-end -end procurement processes and understand the impact of it and we understand our business. So I think, um, you know, we shouldn't, solely focus on just uh, developing all of these new data literacy uh, sort of uh, uh, capabilities. We, we also need to continuously um, evolve, uh, develop ourselves in, in procurement as a profession as well. Yeah, hundred percent. So I have a couple of thoughts on that, which, which uh, I mean, I agree with you on that. I, I wanna, I'll, which I'll share, uh, but Graham, your thoughts from a CASME perspective. Yeah, I mean, actually, I just want to uh, uh, relate to a point, thanks to Simon, that sort of said effective prompt writing. I, I mean, you, you said these are quite easy to use, these tools with the natural language, but actually, are they? The amount of times that you key in something and you think that's what you want, but yeah. you realise actually you've worded it in such a bad way. And and I the amount of times I've keyed in something, it's like, oh no, you just haven't really, why aren't you listening? Why aren't you doing what I've said? But that skill that needs practice is one of writing those prompts so that you are very clear cut what you want included and what you don't want included. So my sort of recommendation would be if you're not using Chat GPT4 and really experimenting and using that of developing that skill to write the prompts to give you the information that you're looking for and then being able to work out what is of a value and what is clearly rubbish and yeah. as you said right you've got to read it yourself you can't just leave it and send the email send the report you've got to read it and otherwise it can be really convincingly wrongly stated to to you so i think yeah. that's the skill that we all need to develop and that's going to become even more important going forward yeah fair point ruji i think you want to add something yeah if, if i just add to to that graham so i i think with the prompts it's it's like learning a new language mm. um and and i think you start with learning a few words um and then very soon you know with with practice words become sentences and then they become phrases and then conversations so I, I think it is a different language and you do need to experiment um, but check with your organization of course um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to experiment and test and, and just get comfortable yeah I, so so uh, so if I sort of distill a few points based on what everyone just said and I have a I have a little bit of a contrarian take on that prompt point, which I 100% I agree with everything that you just said, Graham, which is we need to be able to ask the right questions in order to get the right answer. But let me come back to that. I think from an overarching skill set, I mean, clearly what, what if, if for the audience, if we distill down, there's data literacy and some level of technical understanding, which is important, but procurement end-to-end, -end, which I think gets into a lot of aspects of fundamental understanding of what we do, Right, so not just the seven-step sourcing process, but what it really means uh, uh, by each stage of that activity. Uh, the relevant business acumen to be able to interpret and make the right decisions and calls and interpret the, the AI, if you will. Um, uh, uh, adaptability, uh, Ryan, you touched on that that right off the bat, right, and that openness to change, I think, is a, is an important one. Um, and agility, if you will, both technical and otherwise. 
And then this idea of continuous learning, right? So we need these skills uh, developing it forward. Um, I actually, on the prompt writing point, um, I've heard a few interesting takes, right? Which is, so first off, Graham, 100% agree, right? You need to be better at prompt writing. I, it's quite interesting. I wonder if the AI tools of the future are going to get better at that and that prompt writing will move to a point where, yes, we have to be able to ask the right question, but it'll be also be better at figuring out the intent. So, Ryan, to your example about the Microsoft ecosystem, and um, uh, and actually you were talking about before this, Copilot, and how Copilot, once it sits in your, your ecosystem, it can look at your PowerPoint reports, it can look at your emails, it can look at your X, Y, and Z, and then come back and craft. If it gets to know us, then it kind of figures out our intent, if you will. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but at some point I could see where the prompt writing even gets where I, I know what you meant to ask, and this is what you meant to ask, and here's what the answer is, right? Uh, which is a, a little bit scary and a little bit exciting, but but uh, but I wonder if it'll get there. So open question. I have no answers to this. I just, uh, it's a perspective. Um, one part, and I, I'm mindful of our time. We always do this. We always run out of time, but um, I'm mindful of time. But, but I do want to ask one uh, sub question to this, which is, is there a profile of a role or a person who should be concerned? for a future post-gen AI procurement world. Uh, Ruji, I'll ask you to kick off there. Yeah, um, I think there is um, two, I would say, profiles. One is um, a buying role where an individual is purely doing transactional work. Uh, because in the the effort to drive efficiency and standardization um, and the, the uh, at the moment the, the availability of automation um, and it's it's very mature now process automation um, so I think companies are really that's the first place they're going so those roles where it is purely transactional buying type of roles I think very soon yes those those roles will be automated. Um, the second profile, I would say, is individuals who are unwilling to upskill themselves and adapt. Um, they will find themselves struggling. Um, and, you know, I certainly come across a lot of people sort of saying, well, I'm a category manager or I'm a relationship manager or, you know, contract manager or whatever. And, you know, this is the job for a center of excellence or something like that. But again, um, I, I think that we don't have that luxury. Again, we got to, we have to do more with less. So the more willing you are to um, uh, to, to broaden your skill set, to, to reskill and upskill, I think the easier you will find to, uh, to, to move with the changes that are here. Um, so it's not that we have to wait for the changes to come. Yeah. Ryan, your thoughts? I, I... I know you agree with that second point that Ruji uh, raised there. Those are the exact two bullets that I had. Um, <laughs> one one other thing that I've just been thinking about is um, people that are not willing to learn. Um, and so it's different than change. It's it's the learn. So uh, just recently I was uh, working on our, our annual plan. What does that look like? And so I, I spent a couple of days. I came up with all these fantastic bullets about, you know, what is the strategy of our procurement organization? Then I thought, hmm, I wonder what ChatGPT would say. And <laughs> ChatGPT cranked out almost exactly what I had put. And the interesting thing about that is that I can do it without, but it just helped me to do it faster. Um, mm -hmm. I'm concerned about what does it look like in the future for people that don't know how to do it without? You know, and so I think it's still important that we really learn and understand, well, why is it saying this? So if, if it comes out and gives you some sort of an output, why did it say that? Is that correct? You know, and so if you can't interpret, um, and interpretation only comes because you have background knowledge. And so I think um, outside of what was said, and that that was not on my notes, that just came to me this morning, but um, I just think it, it, it's going to be very interesting to see what the world looks like for those that do not start to learn with AI. So AI should help you to learn quicker, but you have to be able to, to interpret. And so if you can't, I think that that would be an area of concern. Yeah, I, I want to jump to the next poll, but but on that point, actually, it's really interesting. I was listening to a podcast yesterday where they talked about what are we going to be like? Part of the reason each of us have kind of, you know, learned what we've learned is we've done it without AI for the most part, right? And But there was a struggle that was involved in getting there. Yes. And that struggle is instrumental to that understanding. 
if AI takes that struggle away, what what does that do? What does that mean for us, right? And I think that's a, I think that's an interesting question, right? Uh, in in terms of where uh, where things are going to go. So I, I think that's that's fascinating um, to see how that's going to play out. Um, but in the spirit of moving uh, on, uh, Graham, poll number three. Poll number three. Okay, so related to that and getting everyone trained and prepared for this, have you participated in any organizational training or development programs aimed at preparing you and your and or your team for the AI driven future of procurement? Select one. Very simple. Yes, regularly. Occasionally, no, I'm not aware of such programs. No, my organization does not offer such programs. So as, and I've, I've been keeping a, an eye on some of the comments and the questions coming in, and the question seems to be, how do you get this training and get equipped and learn when you don't necessarily just want to go to the suppliers that are trying to flog you, uh, sell you systems in this area? It's not easy. There isn't a book. Um, I mean, that's one reason why everyone's here, I guess. It's a, a popular, uh, we've had uh, almost 700 people register to, to get this information because we're all learning. It's all new for everyone. And I think that's almost makes it quite exciting. But in terms of specific training, let's uh, give you a few more seconds just to, uh, uh, to respond to that. And um, and then we'll uh, we'll look at the, uh, the results there. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop that there and share the uh, the results with you. So yeah, no, I'm not aware of such programs is the largest at 35%, followed by occasionally ad hoc at 30%. No, my organization doesn't offer at 25%. And yes, regularly, only 10% of you. Yeah. You know, I have to say this doesn't surprise me. Not at all. Mm -hmm. I, I know, uh, Ryan, uh, your thoughts? Uh, again, I, we're going to repeat a little bit. I think it goes back to definitions. And so uh, it depends on what you consider AI. Um, uh, there are not a lot of programs because I don't know that we know what the future of AI looks like. I, I think about when we were in the middle of COVID, I shouldn't say that bad word, but we were in the middle of COVID and we were talking about what, what does the future of the workforce look like? And we say, well, it doesn't look like it looked like before. It doesn't look like where we are now. So it's something different. And I think the AI is the same way. Um, it doesn't look like where we were five years ago. It probably doesn't look like where we are now. It's something different. Um, and so again, I, that's that's kind of my thought on that. Yeah, Ruji. Yeah, and um, Omar, you and I have spoken about this topic before, but it, it, I I completely agree. I think um, that yes, there is the definition, but also there isn't. I think a collective um, effort behind this as as much as there should be. Like I said before, the pace of technology development and implementation is moving so fast, and if people feel that their upskilling uh, is not in line with that it's it's really dangerous because what we'll do is invest in all of these solutions and then the adoption's not there because people are uncomfortable or unaware of how to get the best out of it um, and i think what i would say to people is um, start with simple things um, we you should generally have a spend analytics tool even if that is um, excel based for like smaller organizations um, and then even there with things like um, tableau or, or smart sheet for example that has a type a, a low level ai built into there so i think get comfortable with solutions which um Sorry, I just blacked out for a second. Solutions which um, you, you do have access to. Um, and also, I think um, sometimes a lot of companies with, within procurement functions, what you have is a center of excellence. Um, get closer to that procurement center of excellence because I think they're the ones who are having all the fun and all the, you know, they're playing with all of the tools and technology and, and they're moving fast with their upskilling. Whereas it's the buyers and the, the category managers actually, I think, um, took some of those activities from that center of excellence and really understood how to run those reports, how to manipulate those spreadsheets and th those contracts and, and utilize those technologies. I think um, there's a lot of self-learning you could do yourself there as well. 
So, so you, so you, you, you segued nicely into that the, the the third question we have, which is how can we begin to bring our people along towards this future state? How do we prepare them today, and what are some of the things you're doing? So, exposure, uh, adoption of tools, I think is is a critical one, right? No matter what the level uh, or sophistication of the tool is, but beginning to adopt and utilize those tools. Number one. Um, uh, getting involved in some of those initiatives and projects. What are some other, um, oh, there's that's my Microsoft uh, uh, <laughs> balloons going off. Um, I'm gonna be careful with my hand gestures. Um, what are some other uh, 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 things that we can do to prepare our people for this future state? I gotta figure out a way to turn that thing off. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, Ryan, I'll ask you to to to, to go here. Well, that was AI in progress. We saw it work. You made some gesture and there it went. Um, you know, I think the best way to prepare is just to share use cases. This is how I'm using it. This is how it's making my life better. Um, I think, uh, and my team, it's been frequent one-on-one -on -one conversations. It starts with people that are champions uh, that love to use it and start seeing some benefit. I think in a lot of cases, we just need to understand what is the benefit. So we have to start with something. I think uh, we've heard you know, within our our centers of excellence, ours is working on how do we digitize data entry? How do we utilize robotic process automation to standardize tasks that, or to automate tasks that are very standard? Uh, we're looking at chatbots. Uh, we're looking at um, GitHub, which is our internal chat GPT or uh, Microsoft Copilot. And so you have to just start with something and start playing with it. And then I think the adoption comes. Yeah. Ruji, makes sense. Would you add anything to those points? Yeah, a couple of things. I I think um, <clears throat> don't, um, consider buying rather than building. Um, and I'm just saying that after Ryan said <laughs> they've got an internal tool. Um, I think because the benefits of buying is you know go to the expert. We're the expert for whatever it is in our field. Go to the expert for that technology. The chances are they're working with um, your peers or even others. Um, and so there's a lot of knowledge that they can share and, and help you move faster in, in the process. Um, the second thing I would say is for organizations and individuals, do do a self-assessment, do an honest self-assessment, look at your uh, skill sets, um, soft ones and, and technical ones. Um, and then, you know, look at uh, where am I strong and of course build further on that, but look at the gaps and, and put together a plan uh, for how to improve and close those gaps. Um, and, and again, you know, that's continuous growth mindset, I would say. Yeah, Graham, how does this reflect come on if you think about the Casme community and what they're mm. doing and what your members are doing to prepare themselves? I think the main message I'm hearing is is exactly as we've been hearing. Do something. So mm. just practice, use it. And and certainly the top tools mentioned in our surveys are ChatGPT and also the uh, the Microsoft uh, Copilot. Just get using them, see what they can do. In terms of other systems, then as a uh, rolling out to help stakeholders, then actually chatbots are top of the list. They're, they're quite cost effective. Um, I will share a very loud message coming back from those that have done this is please have a human also connected with the chatbot. Don't allow your stakeholders to go in that spiral. That just means they get nowhere fast if they ask a, a really difficult question. But in terms of generally provided that guided buying to your stakeholders, then it's very effective for not an awful lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So if I sort of summarize and maybe add a couple of points, you know, I think what, what we're clearly he hearing is how do you prepare Tech technology exposure in whatever way uh, uh, that you can get it. Um, uh, exposure to what other groups are doing. I might even extend that to say other cross-functional initiatives start getting engaged with other stakeholders in the organization, uh, obviously strategic projects we've talked about, taking on specific initiatives, and then soft skills enhancement. I think that's just going to be so, so important. Um, in an age where, um, and again, I don't want to overstate this, but in an age where the AI is going to take over the transactional and automate a lot of things, um, we're still going to have to make the decisions. We're still going to have to think strategically. We're still going to have to manage relationships and get people across the line to make a particular change in terms of internal stakeholders. 
we're still going to have to drive innovation. So I think those are, you know, those are fascinating ideas in terms of how we can begin to tackle this and 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 develop. And of course, these are early days. Much more to come, and much more even as the market itself evolves over the coming months and years uh, to see where it goes. Um, we have ten minutes. I want to let's do the next, the last and final poll, and then let's dive into the final takeaway questions. And hopefully, we can have some Q and A. Okay, a more complex poll question. So, what if your what? What are your expectations of how AI will impact procurement in the near future? So we are more forward thinking one. And please answer your top three. You can always tick them all, but just answer the, the top three. So are we about providing better data analysis for improved decision making, offering real time performance tracking for risk mitigation and forecasting? enabling greater strategic value based on relevant insights, ensure higher compliance and visibility of procurement tasks, fostering collaboration between different teams, the automation and collection of spend data and its analysis, implementing chatbots, as I mentioned, to help stakeholders with guided buying smart authoring within the RFX development process and deliver cost savings by taking care of mundane tasks. You could also have other, and please put the other in the, the chat and we'll pick those up and, um, and include those. So a whole number of different areas that we've deliberately included because people have already been talking about, this is what they expect to see as an impact of AI in procurement. What are your views? What do you see that near-term future looking like, given the selection of probably three out of that list there? Just give you a few more seconds to uh, uh, to complete that, and then we'll share the uh, the results. And I think that will then give a great sort of feel for what procurement is doing in this area now, and hopefully give you some guidance as to what to work on. That's enough time. Let me end the poll. Um, I'm just going to call out a couple of ones because we'll use all our time. Providing better data analysis for improved decision making. A very consistent theme with that answer. The whole CASME benchmarking surveys also made that a really clear priority. I can't use the percentage because uh, you, were, you could complete more than one, but the longest bar. Automation of the collection of spend data and analysis. In our research, a lot of the more tactical activity seems to be the area of focus to begin with. And we all know about wanting data analyzed. We need clean data. And in fact, one of the points in the questions is, do you really start AI before you've got clean data? That's a chicken and egg situation. But certainly AI can help do that cleansing, do that matching up. And then I think the third one on the list here is delivering cost savings by taking care of mundane tasks. So we're not losing sight of what we really do need to spend a lot of our time doing, and that is taking cost out. These are tools, and clearly they can help. Any observations? So data spend and uh, cost uh, automation of the mundane. Um, Ruji, your thoughts? Yeah, it's... Um... It's definitely the, the place to start again because of the maturity of the technology. Um, so it makes sense. Um, however, what I would say is really embrace AI because there are some really amazing solutions out there where you can utilize it for smart negotiation, um, uh, contract insights and uh, compliance. Um, there's a lot of great technology out there, although early days. So if you have the opportunity, also experiment with them, explore with them. Um, uh, it's just a matter of companies adopting them and using them and the maturity before they also become mainstream, just as we do, we're the ones that we're talking about in terms of data analytics. So if you want to stay ahead of the curve and, you know, create that competitive advantage, um, when you're looking at your data, your, your technology tech stack, um, then also consider the, those solutions in the more strategic areas. 
So uh, I'm going to segue since we have it's five minutes. Um, and Ryan, maybe you can provide your thoughts on the poll and then answer this question as well. No. Nope. Which is the which are the key takeaways? Um, what advice would you have for the audience and procurement practitioner? What's the one thing they can do to begin to prepare for this brave new world today? And I, Ruji, I think you touched on uh, that key point, which is experiment, adopt, start using. Does that make sense? Is there, is there anything else you'd add to that? No, no, no. Nicely wrapped up. Thank you, Omar. Ryan? Hey, just a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, one of the questions that we have that we didn't cover is, you, you know, how eminent is it? Well, it's it's here. And so if we don't realize that it's here, um, you know, then we really need to look at that. Um, I've always been of the opinion that I'd rather change than be changed. And so that's what we're doing within our organization. Um, and I think the other thing is just establish some goal. Um, so the goal that we've set in our organization is, is save an hour per day. It's efficiencies by a thousand cuts. It's 10 minutes here, 15 minutes here. Um, and I think that's how we get efficient. It's not like one person's job goes away, but we all just get more efficient in, in the way that we work. And so, you know, embrace it. it it's here. So go with it. it. Yeah, I love that. Graham, your thoughts? Yeah, to be honest, I don't think I've got anything more. I think we've been saying it and it's quite a consistent sort of message. I think the main point is just do it. Trial it out. And I, I like your point, Ryan. It is about saving 10 meeting, ten minutes here and there. So if you've got to take actions from a meeting, make sure you've got some system to capture that information and then summarize it for you, then you've got that summary and move on. It's It really is that straightforward. It's uh, uh, The perception is that it's more complex than it actually is. Just mm. get get on and do something, and that will then lead you from, from A to B and then onwards. Yeah. Well, great. Let me let me recap with a few, I think, important takeaways uh, that I got from the conversation over the last hour. Um, I think a few key points that for folks to remember: be problem statement driven, as opposed to the uh, the uh, fashion of AI, if you will, if I can use that term. Right. That's number one. Soft skills are absolutely critical. You have to begin to think beyond the transactional in your personal role, because if that's where you're spending a lot of your time, that's an issue. That's going to be an issue. Um, openness to change. Adoption is critical uh, in terms of what we're doing and do something. Experiment, uh, try out different technologies, tools, and then uh, and adopt from that point forward. So I think those are probably the, the key takeaways if I were to, to summarize kind of the conversation of the last hour. We have two minutes. We always do this. We always run out of question, no, yes. question time. Uh, Graham, any, any question you want to pick up? Maybe one? There were so many questions. Everyone's got this appetite wanting to learn. So I guess the question I would summarize, um, Ryan Buji, is there anywhere else that you think people could sort of learn? What would you say how to start in addition to just getting chat GPT and playing with it? Is there any other source of information? How did you get into it to really start that process learning? That's, that's I, I how I did it. I, I just started playing with ChatGPT personally. Mm. I watched a couple of YouTube videos and saw, oh, wow, this could actually uh, be implemented someplace else. And then as our company um, got to the point where they were willing to put a chat GPT behind a firewall so it was safe, um, it was a relatively easy thing for me to do to go out and just say, hey, this is pretty cool. Give it a try. Rudy. Um, so then to add a different one, I'd say um, read, read up best practices. Um, people are blogging about what they're doing um, and, and not just in procurement, but also different functions. So um, there's lots of use cases out there and uh, you know, whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's YouTube or, or just generally um, searching under different universities or close to your um, IT team because they're implementing AI solutions for different parts of your organization. So I think just um, reading and learning about use cases elsewhere and being curious about, well, if it works there, how can I take it and apply it to procurement? So back to my earlier point, you have to master procurement. You have to master the end-to-end -end process. And then you'll have the opportunity to say, well, actually, this AI tool fits best here or there. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's both of you. That's spot on. Um, blog posts, articles, white papers, try different things. 
Uh, I would just say if somebody's written a book on it, it's probably already out of date, uh, given what's going on, uh, just given cycle times with books. But we are right on the hour. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, both our panelists, Ruji, Ryan, and of course, Graham, um, uh, for being part of this uh, webinar. Thanks, everybody who dialed in and uh, spent the last hour with us. And uh, we will uh, apologize if we didn't get to questions, but for those regulars, you know, we never do. Um, but it was good discussion, good conversation. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.